biological safety and infection control let us study these two topics today what is the importance of biosafety as defined by the who laboratory biosafety describes the practices that should be implemented to prevent the unintentional exposure to pathogens and their toxins healthcare workers are exposed to various blood borne pathogens for example hiv hepatitis b hepatitis c etc what are the biosafety levels as per the guidelines of who and cdc nih laboratory facilities have been assigned four biosafety levels for working safely with microbial agents basic is biosafety level 1 another is basic biosafety level 2 the next higher is containment biosafety level 3 then maximum containment biosafety level 4 biosafety level designations are based on 1 the design features construction containment facilities equipment practices and operational procedures required for working with agents from the various risk groups and 2 risk assessment which evaluates the pathogenicity of the agent the mode of its transmission the amount of the agent manipulated and the nature of the work performed how do we classify infective microorganisms as per the risk group this is how it is done as we can see in the table a risk group 1 is where the individual risk is nil or very low and the community risk is also nil to low the pathogenicity here is that it's unlikely to cause animal or human disease or it is otherwise you can call it a non pathogenic agent risk group 2 would be where the individual risk is moderate and the community risk is low this means this organism is pathogenic for humans but unlikely to be a serious hazard treatment and preventive measures are available for it and there is a limited risk of spread of infection when we say risk group 3 we mean that the individual risk is high and the community risk is low that means it is pathogenic and can cause serious disease but there is effective treatment and preventive measures which are available and there is little chance of a person to person spread when we look at risk group 4 it means both individual and community risks are high and the pathogenicity indicates that it is a lethal pathogenic agent readily transmissible so directly or indirectly it is infective and effective treatment and preventive measures are not usually available please note that the risk group does not equate to biosafety level of the laboratories so how do we do a biological risk assessment the backbone of the practice of biosafety is risk assessment risk assessments are performed by laboratory personnel taking into consideration the type of patient population the tests being performed and the risk group of the microorganisms involved as we saw in the table before risk assessments should be reviewed and revised routinely listing of risk groups for microbiological agents using a risk prioritization matrix listing potential scenarios of problems during a procedure a task or an activity the process involves the following steps identify the hazards associated with an infectious agent or material identify the activities that might cause exposure to that agent or material evaluate and prioritize risks that is evaluate the likelihood that an exposure would cause a laboratory acquired infection and the severity of consequences if such an infection occurs develop implement and evaluate controls to minimize the risk for exposure This is how we do a risk assessment process flow chart. To begin with we identify the hazards. The agent if known, the lab procedures and the worker hazards. Based on that, we evaluate and prioritize the risks. From there we determine the necessary controls and we implement the control measures. Both of these are related to engineering controls administrative and work practice controls and personal protective equipment once we implement the control measures we must evaluate the effectiveness of that implementation of controls once we have an evaluation whatever we find as a result goes back 
to add to the evaluation and the prioritization of the risks and the whole cycle can be again followed. On the basis of the information ascertained during the risk assessment, a biosafety level can be assigned to the planned work and appropriate personal protective equipment can be selected and standard operating procedures or SOPs incorporating other safety interventions can be developed to ensure the safest possible conduct of that work. What are standard microbiological practices? 1. Access to the laboratory should be controlled and appropriate signages should be posted like biohazard signs and restricted entry to working areas. 2. Persons must wash their hands after working with potentially hazardous materials and before leaving the laboratory. 3. Eating, drinking, smoking, handling contact lenses, applying cosmetics and storing food for human consumption must not be permitted in laboratory areas. 4. Mouth pipetting is prohibited. Mechanical pipetting devices must be used. 5. Performance of all procedures to minimize the creation of splashes and or aerosol production. 6. Policies for the safe handling of sharps such as needles, scalpels, pipettes and broken glassware must be developed and must be implemented. 7. Decontamination of work surfaces after completion of work and after any spill or splash of potentially infectious material with an appropriate disinfectant. 8. Decontaminate all sculptures, stalks and other potentially infectious materials before disposal using an effective method. 9. All laboratory personnel and particularly women of childbearing age should be provided with information regarding immune competence and conditions that may predispose them to infection. There is also an importance of special practice in that 1. A laboratory specific biosafety manual must be prepared and adopted as policy. 2. Training should be imparted regularly regarding prevention of exposure and post-exposure procedures. Staff training should always include information on safe methods for highly hazardous procedures that are commonly encountered by all laboratory personnel, which involve inhalation risks, that is aerosol production, when using loops, streaking agar plates, pipetting, making smears, opening cultures, taking blood or serum samples. Ingestion risks when handling specimens, smears and cultures. Risks of percutaneous exposures when using syringes and needles. Handling of blood and other potentially hazardous pathological materials. Decontamination and disposal of infectious material. 3. A pre-employment health check is necessary. The person's medical history should be recorded and occupational health assessment must be performed. The records of immunization and prophylactic interventions should be maintained for each employee. 4. Incidents that may result in exposure to infectious materials must be reported and immediately evaluated and treated according to procedures described in the Laboratory Biosafety Manual. Let us look at the importance in the use of safety equipment, that is, providing primary barriers and personal protective equipment. One is biosafety cabinets. They must be used whenever infectious material is being handled, like microbiology cultures, stalks, etc. Two, centrifuges. These are potentially infective materials which should be centrifuged in the laboratory using sealed rotor heads or centrifuge safety cups to prevent aerosols. Three, screw cap tubes and bottles. Four, autoclaves or other appropriate means to decontaminate infectious materials. 5. Plastic disposable pasture pipettes whenever available to avoid glass. 6. PPE, that is personal protective equipment including gloves, laboratory coats, goggles, mask, face shield. These are used for anticipated splashes or sprays of infectious or other hazardous materials when the microorganisms must be handled outside the BSC or containment device. D. Let us look at laboratory facilities where we can provide secondary barriers. 1. The laboratory doors should be self-closing and should have locks in accordance with the institutional policies. 2. The laboratories must have a sink for hand washing. This sink may be manually, hands-free or automatically operated. 
It should be located near the exit door. 3. The laboratory should be designed so that it can be easily cleaned and decontaminated. Carpets and rugs in laboratories are not permitted. Spaces between benches, cabinets and equipment should be accessible for cleaning. Bench tops must be impervious to water and resistant to heat, organic solvents, acids, alkalis and other chemicals. Chairs used in laboratory work must be covered with a non-porous material that can be easily cleaned and decontaminated with appropriate disinfectants. 4. Laboratory infrastructure must be capable of supporting anticipated loads and use. Let us come to waste disposal, a very important item. Correct waste disposal system is important for biological safety. All waste generated needs to be categorized into 1. Non-contaminated, that is non-infectious waste, that can be reused or recycled or disposed of as general household waste. And 2. Contaminated or infectious sharps, hypodermic needles, scalpels, knives and broken glass. These should always be collected in puncture-proof containers fitted with covers and treated as infectious. 3. Contaminated material for autoclaving and disposal. 4. Contaminated material for direct incineration. Please note that you must follow the written protocol developed by the laboratory as per the local biomedical waste disposal.